नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुस नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत भगवत अर्हत संबुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुस् नमो तस् भगवत नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुदे आई एम वेरी प्लीज टू बी जॉइनिंग दि ग्लोबल बुद्धिस कॉन्ग्रिगेशन इन औरंगाबाद इन इंडिया फॉर दिस ऑस्पेशियस विशाख फूड मुन डे प्रोग्राम ऑल टूगेदर आई हेव सेवन क्वेश्चन I will be touching on uh, some of them. If I don't have time, if I have time, maybe I run through all of them. But I will be emphasizing uh, my own practice, which I hope okay to share with the people today. The questions. Are just from from four people. Seven questions from four people. So in order um, to connect with the wider Buddhist congregation in Aurangabad and also beyond that in India, and perhaps also also India. I'll be touching on some aspects of the Buddhist teaching and practice, which I think um, are important. The first three questions are from Sandeep and Tipa Campbell from Nagpur. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly. I have heard has conceptualized. And constructed Lugudra Bhikkhu Center, so specializing in uh, Buddhist architecture. The three question: number one, how to practice to achieve four stages of Soda Panasakata Kami and Nagami and Arahanta in today's busy schedule of modern world. Number two is also, in some way, related to the first question. That is, how to practice to achieve all the four stages uh, till arahanta in all three lifespans of childhood, adulthood, and old age. And number three, what exactly we achieve. When we become <coughs> sota panna sakata kami anagami and arahant, I would not be describing the stages. 
because all the great meditation masters, they have taken from the scriptures and have it ex- explaining all those stages to their students. The way they explain are also very interesting. I just would like to refer to you, for example, from Myanmar. The way Ma Sisiaro and his teacher Min Kun Siaro is playing the four stages. Okay, they take from the suttas and also from the visitive mark. Mogo Siaro, for example, um, didn't refer <coughs> didn't refer to the visited Maka so much. <coughs> Instead, uh, he would refer to the canonical text of the three stages that we can see in the second sermon of the Buddha, the Anatta Lakanasa, at the end. So when you talk about the sixteen stages of achieving. A real stage, okay, the part leading to uh, all those uh, four stages that you mentioned in your um, in your question, the four stages. So, some teacher would describe the sixteen stages, um, taking from the wisdom marker and the Bodhisattva marker. Some teacher would go just by the canonical text. Um, of course, there are other teachers. I'm just mentioning um, the teacher that I'm familiar with. The teacher that I'm less familiar with, like Pao Siada, who combined both the Samatha and Vipassana. And uh, very important, Another very important teacher of our time, the most venerable Ajahn Chah of the Thai Forest Meditation Master, and the way he described them uh, is also very interesting, just as uh, Pao Siaro. They don't contradict each other at all. Instead, as the Wisdom Maka mentioned, to us, that each teacher explains only his own experience through his experience. The way people achieve these stages, these meditation stages, the final destination is the same. But some people would focus on uh, physical matter. Some people would focus on um, some concept in the mind, the development of concept, um, how they, they disappear. Some people would focus on reaction. Some people would focus on pain, on weight. Some people would focus on what they see outside. The temperaments are different. So, about the four stages, I just would like to say this much, but I'm more interested in the the part of your question when you say, in today's busy schedule of modern world, how do we achieve this? I think this uh, question is very important. I just would like to recall one incident during the Buddha's time. Um, one day, okay, this was in India. One day, a Buddhist monk, uh, not just one day actually, regularly a Buddhist monk went to a family's house 
for his arms for Pindapada, okay, to collect his, his arms round. Uh, because he was a well practiced monk. And the, the man from the family who with the from the household who donated, who offered his his uh, his meal on daily basis was very inspired. So he asked the monks how to practice. So the monks told him gradual steps. Just one at a time. One at a time. Starting from generosity and then to develop some ethics, some ethical behaviors towards other people at work, at home, in the society, like this. And uh, to train his mind directly using meditation. After that, uh, he was making steady progress that he wanted to become a monk himself. So he became a monk. That was during the Buddhist time. This story is in the Dhammapada. When he became a monk, he, um, because a monk is expected not just to practice for himself, but also to share his practice with other people. In order to do that, he had to follow a certain um, syllabus. So he studied the Vinaya, and then he studied more suttas, he studied uh, about uh, you know, the details of the mind, Abhidhamma. Then one day, he, 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 just, he just became so overwhelmed by the workload. Wow, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving, I'm leaving the monkhood. So he went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha said, forget all those things. Just focus on your mind. Just focus on your mind. Meaning, the pattern of your mental reaction. How the mind reacts to food, how the mind reacts to the news. Say, in today, when we read news on Facebook, on Twitter, okay, on mm, uh, social media, how the mind reacts to that. And when we see our friends or even our colleagues at work, customers, our superiors at work, our subordinates, when we see them, when we see them, we usually have thoughts about them, we usually have reaction to their behavior. To, uh, to what they think. So what the Buddha was saying, just to focus on your mind, just one thing. And he became her. What I want to point out here is that we can make ourselves busy. In doing so, we can lose a big picture. Now, how busy is our life? All these choices are in our hand. But sometimes we cannot resist the peer pressure from the society. When people drive a nice car, you feel the pressure of having to drive a nice car. When people build a big house, then you feel you know, the pressure of having a big house yourself. Usually we do more than we need. Usually we get 
more than we, what we need. I want to emphasize that, okay, is is possible to live our life simply. Okay, to live our life simply. In, in this age. Now, um, I'd like to venture outside the question a little bit. You, you ask about the four stages. Now, without addressing them directly, I would like to say something that might be helpful to, to your question. To always look at our emotion. The Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse of mindfulness of the Buddha, talks about two emotions, meaning the Buddha summarized all of them into two. Abhijja Dhomanasa. That's the word. Abhijja Dhomanasa. The four mindfulness, four foundations of mindfulness, it doesn't matter which one uh, we're inclined to focus on. It can be physical body, it can be um, weight and uh, the, the <coughs> feeling, it can be the um, defilements influencing our mind, or it can be the Dhamma, that is the natural working of the mind. It doesn't matter which, which, which one we focus on. We are loki abhijja dhomanasang, the Buddha said, at the beginning. In the, in the summary, the Buddha gives the summary first. So, when we go to work, if we observe our emotion, like and dislike, when we like something, when we like people, when we like program, when we become enthusiastic, when we like the outcome, just observe our emotion. But when we become depressed, when we uh, become so stressed out, when we don't like certain things, maybe in the meeting, um, maybe in the email, maybe in the chat room, just observe that dislike, a feeling of dislike. We need to catch them there. If we catch them there, then all the defilements will appear. Will appear. If we do so, we will find out how strong our personalizing tendency is. We tend to personalize. This person is like this, this person doesn't like me, this person is good uh, towards me. That kind of personalizing, okay, personalization goes on all the time. When we do that, when we are caught up in that loop of personalization, we don't see dukkha or suffering as it is anymore. Instead, we, we see <clears throat> dukkha, we see suffering as me, as my, as that person, as this person. This person is causing me suffering. See, look at the way this person is causing me suffering. When we view a situation that way, we are caught up in that loop of personalization. The way to transcend that is to look at ourselves as suffering and to also look at that person as suffering. We don't usually do that. We don't usually see that person as suffering. Instead, we see that person as causing us suffering. This is a very subtle point of what we call Sakaya Titi. P 
personalizing tendency. It's because of this outlook of our daily experiences that we get caught up here. We repeat our stress again and again. We repeat our negative thoughts again and again. The negative emotion just reproduce itself again and again. So, um, if we can do this, not only that, we will look at our life and uh, our environment in a simpler way. Actually, life will also become a lot more simple, not as busy as many people tend to think. When we personalize it, now there comes pride. Pride, you know, individual pride. Oh, I need to achieve this, I need to achieve that. And we also look at ourselves as Indian, as Chinese, as Burmese, as English, as European, as American, Italian, Spanish, whatever. In that context, we also get caught up very easily. So when the Buddha talks about Dukkha, the noble truth of Dukkha, he's talking about how the, the um, uh, important, important, the essential need of transcending transcending those limitations, those limitations. And when we can do that, I think we are walking towards these four stages. Something that should anger people, if that doesn't anger you anymore. Instead, you just see pain, in everyone, and you want to help them, I think you are quite close there. I'd like to touch on the last part of your question. <clears throat> what exactly we achieve when we become Sota, Panna, Sakata, Kami, Anagami, Arahant? One discourse that um, many <coughs> Theravada Buddhists know is called Mangala Sutta, the discourse on blessing, the 38 blessing. At the end of it, the Buddha says, Okay, I'm going to recite in Pali. Putasa loka damehi jitang yasa nakampati asokang virajang ke mang etang mangala mutam. I think this answers your question. What the Buddha says is, um, we are unshaken by the waves of experiences, um, <clears throat> negative experiences in, in the world. You know, I mean, unshakable mind. That unshakable mind is uh, a profoundly peaceful mind. Because we know ourselves, our peace of mind doesn't last long. We meditate, after meditation, we feel good, we feel calm. Then, after we have started work, we start accumulating stress, and the impact of meditation okay, evaporates. <clears throat> we don't seem to be able to hold on to uh, the peace that we develop during the meditation. This is an example of a shaken mind, the mind shaken by the stress at work, the mind shaken by how people care about us, 
or how people don't care about us. How people talk nicely about us or how people talk casually, quite dismissively, you know, about us. So we are all quite shaken by those things. To the extent that we need to um, motivate ourselves again and again in life, at work, at home, in the society. People need to find, people need to redefine um, the goal of life, what they want to achieve. Again and again. This is because what they have got become uh, ordinary once again, not exciting anymore. And they need to motivate themselves once again to work hard, to achieve more. I can see you use the word achieve, you know, in all the three questions, achievements. Actually, all those four stages, I don't think they are achievements. They are about um, doing away with uh, what we have. They are about letting go. They are about letting go. And when we talk about letting go, think about fear. <laughs> that come to our mind. Okay, if somebody has got a degree and to let go of that degree and to never mention that again, you can see what fear that would bring to that person. You have got a wealth of experience okay, behind you. Um, as a professional, as this, as that. And to never mention that and just be ordinary, an ordinary person in the crowd. Think about how that you know, would bring a lot of fear, a lot of um, insecure feeling towards you. So this fear causes us okay, to accumulate more than what we need, to speak more than what we should, to make more friends than we need, to talk negatively of people than we ever should. <clears throat> So, if we think about this in our daily life, the pressure from the society, from our surrounding, then we can come back to our mind, we can examine that being unshakable emotionally is quite an achievement. I think this is what the four stages will give us. In the Ratana Sutta, Yatinda Kilo Batawisi Tosiya, Jadubi Wate Bi Asamba Kampiyo, Tatupamang Saburi Sangwata Mi Yo Ariya Sajani Awaita Pasati, Idambi Sanki Ratana Banita Edena Sajina Suati Hodu. This is in the Ratana Sutta. This one talks about the Soda Pana, the lowest of the four, the four achievements, if we use the word achievements. It says that someone who has achieved Soda Pana is unshakable. It's like a very um, huge, solid, and strong uh, pillar that. Uh, people used to have those days 
defending a city kingdom. City when city when a city was a kingdom. Long before nation state came into existence. So those huge columns, they can stand the wind from four directions. This stanza says, it can stand the the blow of the wind from four directions. In the same way, a soda panna, somebody who has achieved soda panna, compare with the ordinary person, Buddha is unshakable in the face of uh, praise and criticism, in the, in the face of good income, less income, less income because of the, the COVID-19, everybody's income is affected, the majority of the people. So, in that state, a Sota Panna's mind is steady. Look at when we, when we have um, delicious food, the way our mind, the way our physical body enjoys it. And then, when um, we are not familiar with the food, or when the food doesn't uh, meet our expectation, the way we react to that, okay, the way we are not quite enthusiastic anymore with the food. See how we are shaken by this. A soda banana wouldn't be, a stream enterer wouldn't, wouldn't be like this and wouldn't behave like this anymore. Of course, if you go, if, if you read the next stanza in the Ratana Sutta, there are times even a soda banana is forgetful. Being distracted by my the sensual world is it can still happen. Busang Bamata. That's the word. But even if a soda bana is so forgetful, that soda bana will never be reborn more than seven times in the human world. We not suffer more than seven births in the human world. That's the mm, uh, description in the Rajna Sutta. So I hope you read more of the Rajna Sutta. I have got two questions from Mr. Rohan Kangurde. Number one is by applying the Dhamma in day to day life, how to concentrate on work or study when you are miserable or stressed? And the second one, how, how to control anger according to the Dhamma? Okay, first, let's talk about stress. Your first question is about stress. Stress management in daily life. I like to talk about Attitude and training, two things. The attitude to life is very important. That's what the Buddha emphasized. We should look at life as ever, um, as, as something never completely fulfilled forever. We may feel satisfied and accomplished sometime, but that feeling doesn't last long. And when we look at other people, P 
people we consider achieve more than us. Now our mind changes. When we think that there are people um, who are working very hard, or who might be achieving what we have achieved, and we can feel threatened by their achievement. So I think to look at to look at the world as um, as um, as a place where we can never really fulfill our um, expectation, our desire, our wishes completely. To always look at life as having something missing. This attitude is very important. You can look at the index of world economy. Even the highest um, achieving country economy, in the uh, economic sense. Okay. In America, um, about 20% of the working adults in their life, okay, the ones in their life, they have to use antidepressants according to uh, Professor Stephen Trizek. You can, look, you can listen to his lecture on YouTube. You can um, type on YouTube like 40 seconds of compassion can save a life. With this, okay, his lecture will come. Up. It's a TED talk. But he also has a longer version of, of that talk. He emphasized compassion. And another professor, another um, medic okay, from Stanford University, Professor James Doty, um, a brain surgeon, who has set up Center for Compassion and Altruism. He also you know, has <clears throat> data on this. I mean, how people feel unsatisfied with their life, with their achievements, because success is relative. It's never absolute. then we need to ask a question. With this attitude, we need to ask a question. What do I want to achieve? Here, so long you want to achieve for yourself, you will be creating more and more stress. In the Buddhist attitude, I mean, I talk about the Buddha, our achievement has to... Um, has to time with, has to uh, be connected with our contribution to the society. The Buddha talks about Buddha Tacharya, Nyada Tacharya, Loka Tacharya. Buddha Tacharya is for self achievement. For the Buddha, it's about enhancing his ability enhancing his wisdom and compassion so that he can help the whole world. But that achievement okay, shouldn't be looked at in isolation because he always connected that with helping his families and friends and his, um, his um, fellow um, countrymen. If we say in India, <clears throat> fellow Indian people, regardless of caste, belief, and social status, 
The third one is Lokatacharya. This one is about the wider world. It's about looking beyond India. It's about looking beyond our country. In my case here in Myanmar, sometimes I also reside in, in the UK. So it's about looking beyond the United Kingdom. It's, looking, it's about looking at uh, our immediate surrounding. Look at the COVID-19, how we are interrelated, for good or for bad. We are so interrelated. So it's not possible just for me to stay safe. The people around me are not safe. But for just for people in my university, in my monastery, in my hometown, to be safe, regardless of what happened to other people in other parts of Myanmar or in other parts of Southeast Asia or Asia, that will not happen. The safety of the people in India is connected with the safety of the people in Myanmar, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, in China, in Bhutan. This is your immediate neighbors. And actually, more than that, we can see now this uh, pandemic of coronavirus also is teaching us, is teaching us that <clears throat> to be thinking only about ourselves, our own achievement, <clears throat> that will not work. In order for us to do well, other people must do well as well. Millions of migrant workers, inter migrant workers, for example, in India, their safety for, and, and <clears throat> their welfare and we their well being is tied to the welfare of the state. If hundreds if more than a hundred millions of people okay, find themselves unable to, to feed their family. I'm talking about India, but this is true to Myanmar, to Thailand, to Singapore, migrant workers in Singapore. If they are not safe, if we don't take if we don't care about them. the other parts of the society will collapse easily, will be in danger. Whatever progress we have made will be jeopardized. That is why, as an attitude, okay, it's important um, to link your own aspiration with um, the way, the um, well-being of the society. If you study, for example, you study engineering, it's very important for you to become a good engineer. This is your personal aspiration, and to get a good job. But this must be tied to the progress of India. If you become a good engineer, this is good for India. Actually, it's more than India. It's good for the whole world. So with that desire to contribute to the bigger society, the wider society, to help relieve the suffering, the shortcoming, in this society. So if we have, the, have this attitude, 
we will always be highly motivated. And our happiness comes from serving the society. So this is attitude. The training, when it comes to the training, of course, the, I mean, uh, we are so lucky these days. We have meditation courses everywhere. In India, outside India, in the West, a lot more in Myanmar. We have about 1,000 meditation centers. That no, uh, one can choose what one likes. So this training is important, but this I'm talking about um, a more formal training. I think it's important to to do a meditation retreat. If you can't do a long one, at least you know, a few days of mind training, intensive training is very important. To just focus on this one. Um, as we usually do, you know, for eight hours a day. And uh, this training, everybody needs it. Because the stress and the pressure from soci- society is so intense. Without this intensive training, how we can withstand that? Just like a sports person. The intensity of the play, the intensity of the sport is so great. If they don't practice, how can they last until the end of the game? So, this is uh, mind training through meditation courses. But in addition to that, I like to talk about emotion training. In the Noble A4 part, the second one, Samma Sankapa, usually translated as right thought. I like to be a little bit provocative and, and translate this as uh, right emotion. It talks about emotion, uh, three emotions. One is metta, the loving kindness. The second one is compassion, karuna. The third one is the ability to let go, to let go and to heal. Okay, if you are very stressed out at work, you come home, you should be able to take a bit of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to sit down and reflect on that. Or maybe just breathe in and out just to heal what you have gone through during the day. This is a part of letting go. In Pali, it's called Nekkama Sankapa. This emotion training is very important. We don't pay attention to emotion. We don't express them. We don't discuss about them. We see um, people talking about emotion as being weak. Actually, in the Buddhist tradition, emotion is emphasized. You talk about, uh, you, can, you can look at the ten duties of a ruler or a king, a government. The majority of those ten factors, they are about emotion intelligence, EQ. You can talk but you can look at the ten defilements. They are about negative emotions. So being able to um, weaken a negative emotion is actually um, walking towards the four stages that the earlier question referred to. Your second one is how could to control anger. I already mentioned about attitude. If you expect 
Okay, there will be shortcoming everywhere, at work, at home, uh, with government decision, with implementation. If you expect this, when you actually face it, you don't explode. Instead, you can deal with the situation calmly and improve it. So expectation is important. Benjamin Disraeli, one of the former British Prime Minister, uh, has um, a phrase that everybody knows. Hope for the best and expect the worst. When the Buddha talks about Dukkha Satya, the, the truth of suffering, he's talking about more than expecting the words, he's actually talking about familiarizing ourselves with the words, training our mind with the words, with suffering. Only then we can develop resilience. Another thing regarding anger is that sometimes we use anger to justify um, our, our action, our reaction. It's always personalizing. We expect someone to perform up to a certain standard when that person doesn't, when that person has not performed. We feel frustrated and that leads to anger. We have a choice actually. To get angry is one choice. Not to get angry but to feel compassionate is another. What compassionate here? Compassion is misunderstood very often. Compassion is about empathizing the failure of that person and wishing to help improve. But if we just condemn, that's not compassion. If we just turn a blind eye, we remain passive. That's not compassion either. Para dukkha patnaya nakara pavati lakana karuna. This is from Abhidhamma commentary. If you listen to the two provinces I mentioned earlier, they have taken the uh, definition of compassion and used that as a scientific definition of compassion. I want to refer you to the Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science published in 2017. Okay. They have um, one chapter tracing the Buddhist roots of compassion and its influence on the scientific study of compassion. So when you have anger and maybe if you don't have Meditation training, maybe it's difficult for you to actually control anger there and then. But afterwards, if you sit down and reflect on that, there are only two possibilities. One is you blame someone. The other is you don't blame other people, actually you blame yourself. Only two reactions. And look at those two reactions without judging good or bad. Just feel the pain. The pain of blaming yourself. The pain of blaming someone. When you blame, when you blame someone else, you are enraged actually, you are suffering. When you blame yourself, you are actually damaging your, um, your own self-confidence. You are just looking at yourself very negatively. You blame someone, you look at that person negatively. See how we suffer from 
negative emotion, negative outlook, negative thinking. We can improve without this negative thinking. Sometimes we fear so much that uh, if we don't blame, if we don't um, be harsh on people, if we don't show our anger, that they wouldn't take um, any hint of um, what's going wrong and uh, they wouldn't improve. The intention looks good. But the way we go about that, we go about implementing that intention is wrong. Is wrong. So just to observe the automatic reaction of blaming someone else or blaming yourself. Breathe in and out, slow and gentle. Okay. This is a habit. This is a pattern. If you get this, your anger will be controlled. The last two questions come from two people. Um, the first one is uh, from Mr. Dada Rao from Mumbai. His question is, what should be the mechanism of having Buddhist studies in different parts of India at the university level. We just have so many choices. But when we talk about university level, we need to talk about research. Research in Buddhist studies. Research means bringing in new knowledge. That's what research is about. We don't pretend that we know everything. We don't pretend that we know all the answers. Instead, we need to uh, be searching, especially in applying the Buddhist teaching to today's problem, in today's world. We need to be asking more questions, searching for answers. It's a lot easier to understand the words of the Buddha from a psychological point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from a neurological point of view, from a sociological point of view. It's a lot easier. So, if Buddhism is studied with those subjects, then I think at the university level, we will do well. Of course, we, for Theravada Buddhism, um, we have to study Pali properly so that we can read the original sources. So at the university level, we talk about a study skill to use primary sources and secondary sources properly. For people who are interested in Vajrayana Buddhism, that's about studying Tibetan, the Tibetan language, and also a lot of secondary literature in English mainly, but you also have some in French. For people who are interested in Mahana Buddhism, then uh, to study Chinese Buddhism is very important and perhaps also Sanskrit. And then to read the secondary literature as much as possible. We can only begin okay, modestly starting with a teacher who is very good with research, who has published something. So to uh, emphasize research at the university level, if we get one person who uh, is active in research, 
that everything we grew around that person. But with our research, we will be recycling all knowledge, all interpretation. There's no one university that can do everything about Buddhist studies. I have studied at Oxford University. I have been to conferences at many universities in Europe and in, in America and some part of Asia, including India, like uh, Mumbai, New Delhi, and uh, Sarnath, uh, Tibetan higher Buddhist uh, studies, universities like that, Nalanda and that. There's no one single Buddhist study department that can do everything. So we have to coordinate, we have to share our knowledge, we have to share our expertise. Getting a scholar who is very good in research and building library resources are the two mechanisms that we need to have. The last question is, um, how do we start more Buddhist study center for lay person in India? Who wants to gain more knowledge about Buddhism and ways to practice it? Mm. Starting a center is actually expensive. Before you start a center, if you can start a group, it's better. A practicing group. You meet regularly. Maybe once in fortnight you come together for one hour, for two hours, you practice. Or every week, perhaps. Maybe once a month you come together longer. So you build them, a community of practitioners, before you build up a center. That can be in somebody's house. That can be in a rented space, maybe in a school, in a community center, like that. This wouldn't cost you so much. In Hungary, in Central Europe, in 1989, as soon as communism collapsed, 12 Buddhists, okay, who have long um, been a Buddhist practitioners, they came together. Some practiced Theravada Buddhism, some practiced Tibetan Buddhism, some practiced um, Japanese Zen Buddhism. Twelve people, they came together. And they brought their books together and also their money. They contributed money together because they wanted to share how much they, they collected, only $200, $200. With that $200, they rented a room in Budapest and they advertised free Buddhism class. Everyone can come and join. So all those 12 people, they share their experiences. They borrowed their books. With those 200, they were able to rent for six months. After six months, they had no idea what they were going to do. You know what? They built a community of um, interested people, people who were interested in the practice. Within, within six months, um, the community has become so large that they cannot, uh, they cannot stop anymore. They have to find a way to, to continue. So <clears throat> they went to the government 
asking for an old office of the Communist Party because they have a certain number of people behind them. They have got the expertise. They have the experience of six months to prove that they can work together. They have a way of operating. So the government gave them free an office which used to be um, the Communist Party's office in one part of Hungary, uh, in one part of Budapest. You know, that place, that office is now a Buddhist college. The only Buddhist college recognized by European, the European Union and financed by the Hungarian government as well as the EU. What I'm saying is that instead of going for a space first, you build up the community first. If the community is strong, a center, any center, is just a matter of time. I'd like to wish all of you happy Vesak. I wish all of you strength and resilience, not just to overcome <coughs> this COVID-19, the coronavirus yourself, but also to help other people um, to stand on their feet, to rebuild their life once again for those who have lost something, and for people who are already helping other people, so that you can also be part of uh, those selfless and altruistic um, endeavor, something which the Buddha always encourages. By connecting with our own dukkha, we connect with other people's suffering. By looking at other people's suffering, we also relieve the stress that we have, the suffering that we have. We are just so interdependent. With this, I wish you a very happy Wisa once again.